Hi, everyone. It is a pleasure to be here today. My name is Luis Alonso, and again, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, so yeah, Kent has explained a little bit um, what happened after the decarbonization of the electric grid and what happened if the entire uh, fleet of vehicles, uh, we make the entire fleet of vehicles electric. Um, what is going to happen is that we can reduce from, let's see if we can pass the slide. <laughs> Sorry about that. So what, what is going to happen is that we can reduce from 17.19 tons of CO2 per person living and working in Kendall Square per year into 15.50 tons of CO2 per person. One third of that is related to buildings and construction. Okay? And when we are talking about CO2, we need to keep into account two different kinds of CO2, the operational CO2 and the embodied CO2. Okay? Mostly when we are talking about construction. Um, so the operational CO2 is all the CO2 that we are producing with the lighting, air conditioning inside of these buildings. The embedded CO2 is the CO2 that is embedded in the materials of construction and the process of construction of the building. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, let's go back. OK. Uh, so just to give a little bit of context, if we look into construction materials, we will see that the sector of uh, steel, iron, and cement produce 9% of the global CO2 of the planet. Okay, that's quite of a lot. Just to give some context, the country, a country like India, produces 7% of the global CO2. That means that 1.38 billion people produce less CO2 than the sector of steel, iron, and cement. That's food for thoughts. Another important thing is how do we calculate um, uh, the uh, CO2 per person in the planet. What we usually do is we look into the country and we see how uh, the production of CO2 of that country and then we divide it per person, okay? With that lenses, countries like the United States and China, they are the most uh, important environmental offenders, okay? That's, that's quite interesting, but if we have different lenses, uh, what if we look into the... Um, Flow, uh, into the flow of trade and goods into the, into the planet. Okay, if we look into those uh, lenses, we will see that China, for instance, is exporting most of the embodied CO2 in the form of vehicles, construction materials, goods, funds into other countries. And this uh, stuff, this, uh, you know, like vehicles, materials uh, of construction, etc., they have the final life in another country. So we should attach that CO2 to the final uh, country and not to China. Okay, let's make that experiment. So if we do that, China can become a negative CO2 producer per person in the planet. Again, food for thought. So I think that's very interesting. So that's the reason why we start in the city science group to research about what is the environmental impact of people living and working in Kendall Square. That's one of the uh, um, challenges that we have. And we were looking into this with the lenses of the consumer carbon footprint. That means we are trying to understand how our daily behavior is producing CO2. And then we are attaching that to each person living and working in Kendall Square. That means each person, we have a different carbon footprint. In order to have a, um, like, let's say, just one indicator, like a normalized indicator like this bubble over here, what we are using is life cycle assessment methodologies in order to have that indicator. But as I say, each of us, we have a different carbon footprint depending on where do we live, how do we move, or even what do we eat. And that's what the team is presenting today. Let me keep focus on the existing buildi buildings in uh, Kendall Square. And let's go back again to operational CO2. I think this is uh, a challenge that we, we can tackle a little bit uh, because it's, all, again, all the CO2 that we produce during the 75 years of the life spam of the building. So how can we reduce the CO2 uh, in existing buildings? This operational CO2 in existing buildings, there are three ways. One is changing the behavior of people. The other is uh, what we usually call uh, building retrofitting, that is more effective, uh, yeah, more efficient uh, technologies. And the third one is deep building retrofitting, that is increase the thermal isolation of our buildings. I'm going to go through the three of them, but let's start with uh, changing our behavior. Um, Let's use one example. I think teleworking is one of uh, the examples that we can use of how that has been changing our lives uh, recently. Um, a lot of people are saying that uh, working from home is going to 
reshape our cities. It's going to be like, like in this movie. Uh, office buildings are going to be empty. Yeah, the, everything is going to be empty. Uh, yeah, OK. I'm so sorry, but I, I don't agree with this. Um, to be honest, teleworking uh, is here since 1980. And we have learned a lot. We have learned that people working from home, usually, they are more efficient than people working from the office. However, people working from home, they are less likely growing in the company because, because the lack of trust. We are humans, but we are still a little bit animals. And we build trust by sharing spaces and sharing ideas face to face. Um, I think that's one of the reasons why, if we look into the numbers, we are kind of coming back to normal. Um, um, people are teleworking kind of in a way very similar to uh, the year 2019, pre-pandemic, when we used to work, telework or work from home uh, between one to three days per week. OK, so let's take that number, three days per week. And let's implement in Kendall Square a policy of people working three days per week. Everybody that lives and works in, in Kendall Square is teleworking three days per week. OK, what is the impact of that? We will reduce the CO2 from commuting. We will reduce the operational CO2 in office but we will increase the operational CO2 in the house. OK, so if we balance all of this, we will have a reduction of 0.05 tons of CO2 per person living and working in Kendall Square per year. It's not bad. Um, uh, however, the socio and economical impacts, they are not going to be uh, very important. They are not going to be significant. So let's move into the next uh, policy. What about building retrofitting? The traditional one. So what if we... Um, make more uh, efficient electric pumps? Uh, what if we make more efficient ventilation and air conditioning, more efficient lighting? And of course, because we are becoming so efficient, we need uh, a, smart, you know, a smart building system to help us to navigate all this technology. Uh, yeah, probably I need two of these. Uh, if we implement this, uh, the operational CO2 is going to decrease because we are becoming more efficient. However, we are bringing more uh, materials to the building, so all the embodied CO2 is going to uh, increase. With that, what we can see is that we can reduce 0 0.40 per, uh, 40 tons of CO2 per person living and working in Kendall Square. That's quite good. And we can have, um, you know, slightly good uh, socio and economical impacts because we are bringing some jobs to the community. Let's move into the deep building retrofitting. That's uh, well, when we, when we talk about deep building retrofitting, we are talking about increasing the thermal isolation, uh, improving exterior cladding, and improving the air tightness of the building. Once again, we reduce the operational energy, uh, CO2, but we, uh, we reduce the operational CO2, but we increase the embodied CO2. With that, uh, we can reduce 0 0.65 tons of CO2 per person, and we will move a little bit the nil uh, in the socio and economical uh, indicators in a positive way because we are going to uh, increase the jobs in the construction sector. OK, but here the challenge is embodied CO2. To be honest, this is a huge challenge because when we are talking about the embodied CO2, we are talking about since we extract the raw material in nature, then we transport the raw material to the factory and we build the uh, material, then we take that building material into the construction site, we build the building, <laughs> and then after the entire life of the building, we demolish or tear down the building, and we discard the material or recycle the material, OK? All that process is producing CO2, and it is embedded in our materials. So <laughs> the challenge here is how can we reduce the embodied CO2 in an existing building in Kendall Square? Well, I, I have been thinking on this. I, a lot of smart people have been thinking on this. And to be honest, is by extending the life of the building, OK? So if we extend the life of the building, that means that we don't have to tear down the uh, existing building uh, and make a new one. You can keep the old building. Uh, at least, usually, we are talking about we can keep the, between the 40 and 60% of the building. And then uh, by using new materials that probably they are going to be more uh, eco-friendly materials, uh, maybe more uh, technologi te technologically advanced materials, like uh, CO2 capture materials, um, maybe we can uh, extend the life of the building. By extending the life, a lot of research is saying that we could reduce 20% of the uh, CO2 emissions of the building when we make a comparison between keeping the old building or building a new one, 20%. Uh, by using local materials, uh, we can reduce probably, um, well, we can tackle this 23% uh, of CO2 that is embedded already in our 
materials because of the transportation. And okay, carbon sequestration materials. These are kind of new in construction. They are not new uh, out there, but yes, it is kind of new in our buildings. And we don't have very good life cycle assessment about these materials. So we didn't include these materials in our calculation. So probably you are saying, okay, so why Luis is talking about this if he's not making a calculation of these guys? Uh, it's because it's a good excuse. It's a good entry point to start thinking that maybe materials, in the step of being a problem, they can start being a solution. What if they start being proactive and they start helping us to reduce the CO2, the NOx, and other gases? What if, in the step of talking about steel, iron, and cement, we start talking about biocomposite, building materials like fungal mycelium, algaes, maybe our materials can capture CO2, and maybe in the future, maybe they can even produce oxygen. Maybe we can live in a building that is alive. I don't know. Okay, okay, okay. I, <laughs> I am going too far, okay? So I'm going to go back um, just to wrap up. Uh, but it, food for thoughts, I think that's important. So um, if we implement uh, deep building retrofitting, building retrofitting, and hybrid work, we can reduce in Kendall Square up to 1.20 tons of CO2 per person living and working in Kendall per year. And also we can have good socio and economical impact because um, we are bringing more jobs to the community. Okay, thank you very much. Now I'm gonna give the mic to Ronan Dolly. He's gonna talk about uh, hybrid work and how hybrid work is gonna help us to reduce that huge bubble over there. Thank you very much. Bye.